this content is for kids. It's not for kids. No, isn't that what I said? No, it's not for kids. If oh. you are 13 years or younger, no. this is not for you. Do I have to kill somebody in order to actually make that point across? No, man, you don't have to kill Wait no a one. second. Oh, no, 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 no. If we return to our planet, the High Court may well sentence you to torture. Greetings, and welcome to another Film Psycho Analysis! I don't know what they have to say, it makes no difference anyway, whatever it is, I'm against it. No matter what it is or who commenced it, I'm against it. Today we are covering the film Cool Summer by Evan Jacobs, released in 2020. This is the current DVD version of the film, Unfortunately, uh, this is all you get. I am hoping in the future there will be an available Blu-ray, but I cannot speak in certainties for the time being. There are no special features. It is just the film. I don't even know. I think there is a rudimentary menu, so that's something on there. Monkey's out of the bottle, man. It is an improvement on some of the other films. This is the end of a trilogy, with the first being 1985-1986, the second being Insect, and this, of course, being the third. So the plot is three middle school boys. They find the days of summer are at an end. But it's about to be shaken up when they befriend a man who may or may not be the serial killer called... The ghost. Ghost. <laughs> so let's talk about the writing. The writing in this piece is pretty top-notch. I love all three of these animated features, as just crude animation is heavily offset by the deep and present writing. The characters are enjoyable, and the tension is quite real, especially when it gets to the part where the person is suspected to be the killer he shows up around halfway through the film, and it just really cranks it up. The acting is about what you could see on these types of films. If you've seen the other two in this series, you know what to expect. The voice acting is not AAA material, but at the same time the characters come across well, and you get what they're going for as far as personality, and they definitely are very different from person to person. That's right, Errol. Why would I have beat up those guys if I was going to hurt you? Why do you want to hang out with a bunch of little kids? You told me to say it to your face, right? Look, I'm not some chicken hawk. I'm only 21. I remember what it was like to be 14. I know what it's like to want to do cool stuff and nobody lets you because they think you're just a kid. So you can stay here in safe suburbia and think you're cool. Or you can come with me and see what cool is. Production design. The animation for this is somewhat crude, just like the other two films, but you do see some minor improvements made with the experienced hand. I think initially adapting to this is one of the hardest parts. But once you have, I'd say around five to ten minutes in the film, the low budget animation fades away and acquiesces to the writing. They also did an interesting experimental thing, splicing in some of the real-world video, making this a little bit more innovative than the other two. Now, music is a cool mix of rock and punk, uh, punk being the central theming in this. It has a great soundtrack, and definitely I wouldn't mind getting a soundtrack for the trilogy, like just burning that on a CD and having that to listen to coming back to, forth to work. It's not very often that you have a film that you look at the soundtrack and go, yeah, I want that. But this is one of those. 
So let's talk about where we are overall. Cool Summer is an interesting way to end the trilogy. Whereas 1985 to 1986 was more of a personal deep dive, and Insect was more of a tense thriller, Cool Summer marries the two, being less perfect than its predecessors, but a much more balanced end for them all. If you can get through the animation and art style of this film, the writing will grab you in a way that I have not been grabbed for a while. I can say that if you like films with a good story and intense narrative, you could do a lot worse than this. Well, that's all we have for the review. I'm going to go away. But when I come back, we're going to do our psychoanalysis. And I'm going to warn you, there are spoilers ahead. So, if you do not want the film spoiled, please stop here and come back after you've seen it. If you're okay with it, though, we're going to be going soon. But I gotta go and do some cool summer in myself. <laughs> So now it's time for the psycho analysis. And now for something completely different. This movie starts with a shriek and a music track. This kind of shocked me the first time around. So we have our three protagonists, Errol, Brian, and Jerry. They're sitting around watching TV while one talks about how they haven't really done anything wild this summer. And they're getting ready to start middle school. Time is running out. This movie leads into the movie 1985-1986. That's that summer right before. They hear on the news about this killer called the Ghost going around and terrorizing the neighborhood. So this is where they incorporate a lot of that cool stuff with the animation. You get to see some of this live action film spliced in. They debate about the killers and plan a sleepover. I like how they talk about this butt magazine. <laughs> it's just thrown in there. <sighs> Those years. <laughs> While hanging out in front of the liquor store, they meet up with these two girls, Isabel and Fresca. Fresca? Yeah. I keep thinking of the drink. Uh, they're talking about the fun zone and how they like to meet up. They agree to meet and bring them pot. Brian seems to think, all oh, this will be easy. You fool! You fell victim to one of the classic blunders! And depending on where they live, if they got the money, they'd be right. <laughs> they're picked on by a few of these older kids and say they're going to kick their asses if they see them again. So they're going to launch to the side and make a plan to buy some beer and get Jerry's brother to take them to the beach. I love it when a plan comes together. I really like how they keep incorporating this real footage. Especially with the little VHS tracking, it just makes it feel like something recorded out of the time. Errol's parents are watching the news report about this ghost killer, and they express concern over the kids walking alone at night. Not really about the fun zone, it's more about walking alone. See, back in those days... I don't want to go on a rant here, but America's foreign policy makes about as much sense as Beowulf having sex with Robert Fulton at the first battle of Antietam. I mean, when a neoconservative defenestrates, it's like Raskolnikov filibuster deoxymonohydroxinate. What the hell does rant mean? Kids are a little bit more free-ranged, so sleepovers like that were pretty common about them just going back and forth to each other's houses. In some other times, trips like the Fun Zone, where tweens would be out, they'd be pretty common, even without supervision. They'd just be dropped off. Is it safe? Yes. It's safe. It's very safe. Is it safe? We didn't really get the whole abduction scare that led to more helicopter parenting until the late 80s, early 90s. It was a little bit there, but nowhere near like it was in the 90s. 
So we cut to the guys together watching scrambled porn. Before that, Brian has told Errol he's desperate mainly because he really wants to score with Isabel. And he's really worried about middle school where he's going to get competition from other guys, especially older guys. And he's right <laughs> in those ways. So as far as the scrambled porn, we all used to try that. Scrambling was this technique where they kind of just scrambled channels that you didn't have. And sometimes if you twisted your eye right, you think you might catch a boob or hear a moan or something. And a lot of tweens and teens would be kind of glued to that sort of thing. Just get to the point! Jerry talks about how his brother may not follow through after all because he's really late. Brian's getting more impatient and desperate. He says this line, it seems like it would never end when talking about summer. And it's really a great look at psychology. The really young see time slow, but as you get older, it starts to speed up. And for Brian, it is. It's speeding up. He's kind of the more adult of the three. And because of that, a lot of his concepts are moving quicker. Jerry goes out by the garbage cans and he knows this creepy car pulling up and just there's this tense moment where he runs off to get the others. Brian and Jerry decide that they should follow the car with Errol being a little bit more hesitant. It looks like the car circles and parks near Jerry's house. They decide we need to go to the neighbor's house and grab a gun. But as the character, shady character, comes out. Brian whacks him in the face, knocking him out. <laughs> they decide to bring him inside and tie him up. So our new guy, Thomas, says he used to live in Jerry's house and was looking at where he used to live. The story is a little bit odd because Jerry's been there his whole life. Thomas offers to get them beer and pot and even take them anywhere that they want to go if they let him go. First, they check to see if the pot's there. Always look for the important things. And then they kind of start to buy his story. When we show up with this pot, it'll be a great night. <laughs> Errol seems leery. I can understand this as there's really only two girls at the party He's likely going to be the odd man out. Not very different than his experience in middle school. Brian, of course, uh, has his Goonies moment, talking about their time. And this convinced them, we got to do this. We got to go for it. I'm taking it back. I'm taking them all back. <laughs> Thomas talks to the group about how girls can kind of use guys. And I love how they still mix this live action stuff with the liquor store. So they're going in, they're getting some beers, and he gets some alone time with Brian. He says, you're kind of a leader, aren't you? You've kind of done everything, but not really anything. And I love that line. It's very true. A lot of times it was the kids who were the more experienced ones in adult things that got to be the heads of any of these cliques. I love his responses, like, I'm only 12. <laughs> it's also fun how this, how he looks at it at the fun zone. And they're talking always, oh, is safe, is safe, is safe. Is it safe? But Thomas is tr right in this. No place is safe all the time. But meanwhile, he's in the car, he introduces them to punk rock. And just says that this stuff is the truth, man. <laughs> Isn't that music all about being crazy and doing drugs? Where'd you hear that? The news? Punk rock? This stuff is the truth, man. <laughs> Truly how I was introduced myself. <laughs> Not by some older potential serial killer driving me around. 
but uh, definitely by a lot of people who would have said that this is the truth. Oddly enough, younger people than me. <laughs> but he gives them some good weed and lets them move on. Amazingly enough, the ghost is not that active right now. Get used to disappointment. Now this fun zone really does have a Santa Monica feel to it. It's been a long time since I've been to California. But I remember Santa Monica. I actually walked from uh, Venice Beach all the way to Santa Monica Pier thinking, oh, that looks... That, 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 uh, that looks good, that Ferris wheel. I think that's close. No. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was just this place where everybody hangs out. And I don't know whether the fun zone was based on something like that, but, it, again, I'm not a California person. I've been to California maybe two, three times in my life. And that's just my experience. I don't have facts to back this up. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, you can tell immediately Errol is weirded out when he ends up taking off on his own because he's feeling that third wheel in the situation. Thomas meets up with him and talks about being left out but standing up for himself. They go and find his friends. Errol's in a better position as he doesn't have any real motivation like the rest of them. They hang out, smoke some weed. The fun is interrupted by the bullies, and Thomas kicks their asses. They leave the girls behind. When Brian says the bullies won't bother them again, I think Errol actually has more of the right of it, because they never really give up. But Thomas tells them, hey, the girls are going home. But the party doesn't have to end. Let's go to this late night party. So Thomas sets up more vibes, talking about dressing himself up so he won't be recognized. Slightly suspicious. <laughs> he is confronted by a junkie, and they are yelled at to get the heck out of there. He finally arrives at this party. It looks to be kicking. But the place that they are going for upstairs is a little bit less hopping. Kind of like kids hang, the kids hang out while Thomas talks business with the guy in the back. This is one of those parties where they're just kind of burnt out, doing drugs, drinking. Not the good end of the party. A lot of the mystery comes down to why Thomas is hanging out with these kids. He is... And this is kind of answered, if you think about it. He's using them as a potential shield to pull off what, what he needs as insurance, that, as it is just unlikely that he will put a hit on the kids, like the, the dealer. You know, he's not going to likely shoot these kids. But hey, that's just a theorizing. A game theorizing! The boys are warned almost as much while they wait for Thomas to make deals. Thomas's business deal does not work out. He ends up butchering a bunch of guys, and he just takes off with the kids after. I admit, I don't care how cool I think a guy is. If he's coming out of a room with blood on him, I'm going to be super scared. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. <laughs> I think Jerry was finally catching on to this a little bit harder to tell them about Brian, who's more, I think, in awe of how cool <laughs> Thomas is. But, uh, and also, I think, in, in, in this need to be somebody cool himself. Thomas then offers to pay a prostitute to, you know, blow them all. And this, of course, wins Jerry over. But Errol again, is like, nah, uh-uh, I'm bailing. And for once, Jerry actually agrees. He managed to appeal to a Jerry. And this ends up causing a bit of a fight between Jerry and Brian. <clears throat> and a lot of this, there's a line in here that Thomas says afterwards, they stopped having fun a long time ago. 
when he talks about the party. I love that line. I see that a lot. I actually do treat people for substances and so on. And yes, we see this a lot. They, they lost their party a long time ago. So they make a last stop. The first ghost crime scene. They go inside the house and explore the scene. Thomas calls the place home, which makes it very suspicious. Thomas reports this house is where his family lived, but he moved out a long time ago. And the ghost had killed his family. He then has them get silent because he says he's hearing a police car. And again, the line, no place is really safe. It's safe. It's very safe. This is taught basically, I says, look at this neighborhood. This is a nice middle class neighborhood, yet these people were killed. Safety can be an illusion sometimes. It gives us a little bit more of a false confidence. And here, we learn that. So they're at a gas station. Thomas sends them in to buy the gas and get some candy for him and, you know, a little bit for them. The radio says the ghost hasn't been active again. And Thomas just takes off, leaving them about three to four miles from Jerry's house. <clears throat> As they go home, they discuss it. I don't know what he was, but he was really cool. The story ends with them coming to school. Brian and he have a conversation about trying to stay friends. Though as many of us know, it's not as simple as they'd like it to be. It's an epilogue. They're all watching TV and, you know, having a discussion about a party. The TV says they got a suspect of who the ghost is. And he kind of looks like Thomas. At least in the sketch. Prompting further questions. The biggest question left unanswered is Thomas the Ghost. There is a lot to him, and it may be the case. Of course, he could just be this bad guy who saw some kids, and he figured it would make his deal go down more smoothly. <clears throat> I like the open end. Because it's one of those things that comes with life. Sometimes you're just not going to get any certain answers. The credits have a pretty cool song where the music is being... They call themselves uh, the Count Catastrophic. Jeff Banks and you and Euhanized. The end song... Those Were the Days, performed by Roots and Boots, was probably my favorite in this playthrough. It's pretty cool stuff and well worth a listen even if it's on its own. <clears throat> so what can I really say about Cool Summer that hasn't been said above? Out of the current three animated features by Anhedinia Films, this one stands out to me as the most balanced, which led me to pull it for the overall review. Because I was going to do one of those animated films. I asked because, again, I wanted to review an Anadinia film. And Evan Jacobs said, can you review one of my animated films? So I picked this for that. I really do feel that this is the best balance of the two. I feel you get a lot of the benefits from this one that you get from 1985-1986. Having relationships with friends, desperation to make life mean something, and understanding how our perspectives change as we get older. Would the Errol at the end of 1985-1986 act the same as he does here? Would Brian be as desperate to make summer count? These are things that define us as human beings and is a good way to go into the film knowing the crazy end of their cool summer. <clears throat> Who knows where thoughts come from? They just appear. Mm -hmm. This film also takes a lot of things from Insect, where it builds tension when you have the killer and never know if Thomas actually was the ghost who killed his family. 
or if he was just simply using the kids for his drug business. It wasn't to the point of horror like insect. The monsters were definitely human beings and not actual monsters like in that film. But you can really take these times where you can just cut the tension with a knife and wonder what is going to happen. This is the last movie that I felt obligated to cover. But unlike Sharkula, or even Shackle Demon Project, this one was the most fun and left me eager to get behind it. So that was Cool Summer. From this point on in the series, when we come back, because we're taking a hiatus, I'm going to cover some films that are not only lower budget films that could fall off the map, but also only covering the ones that I really want to share the word about. I will say that really from this point forward, if I'm covering a film, it is a film that I really like. It's a film that I want to watch. I watch these films five, six times. I watch this one seven times over before writing the script. It takes me a long time to do these. And I really enjoyed it. I wanted to do an Anadinia film, and he did land on one of the films that I liked quite a bit. I like all three of those films, including the extended. Matter of fact, I've got the book that uh, comes with 1984-1985, so I wonder if Cool Summer has a bit of a piece in here, but it's a good companion piece to 1985-1986. So maybe I'll be checking that out and reading it as we go on. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you did, hit that like button, hit that subscribe, and share. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you.